So hello, are we are ready to start our uh, roundtable discussion on the effects of the pandemic, of the COVID-19 pandemic, and subsequent countermeasures on uh, minorities in academia. So we are extremely delighted to see you all here. And of course, we are super happy to have these two outstanding uh, researchers with us today, uh, Lakshmi Ayer. Did I pronounce it correctly? Okay. Mm. Uh, and uh, Alejandra Ramos. Uh, so uh, before we actually let our speakers uh, uh, start the conversation on the effect of the pandemic on minorities in academia, uh, we would like, I would like to spend just a, a couple of words to introduce our speakers. So Alejandra, Alejandra obtained her PhD uh, in economics from Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona and Barcelona School of Economics. And she's now an assistant professor at the Department of Economics of Trinity College Dublin. Uh, she's especially interested in uh, gender and labor economics. And her research is focused on gender norms, uh, intimate partner violence, and how to motivate and retain talented workers. And uh, Lakshmi uh, uh, obtained her PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And she's now an associate professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, she's interested in political economy and development economics. And, and, and her research is especially focused on uh, uh, property rights and the distribution of political power within societies. Um, so be before, uh, again, before we actually start our conversation on the effect of the pandemic on, minority, uh, on, on minorities within academia, with a focus on uh, both students and uh, university employees, such as faculty members, as well as scientific production in general. Uh, uh, we would like to use this opportunity to highlight a little bit uh, who we are and what we do as, uh, as the rare voices in economics team. So Paula, if you want to uh, take on from here. Uh, yeah, I mean, Elore did a really good job this morning, so it's going to be shorter. <laughs> and tomorrow we're going to have a more in deep. So you, if you leave the com like the conference, you're going to really stick with like what it is the our initiative. So who we are? We are a group of PhD students from the University of Lausanne, University of Geneva, and the Graduate Institute, and some postdoc that we have been expanding as well. We have one master student but it's mostly PhDs and postdocs. Uh, what we want, like the objective of the, of the initiative is to work towards a safer environment for minorities in economics, right? So some of us are rare voices in economics, which means minority in some way, while others are allies. And as Laura explained this morning, it's really important to have allies because we're all working towards like the same objective, right? For these, we've been like developed different. Um, we have different initiatives within the initiative that is like the research cluster, where is uh, a space from different universities where we like share the research that we're doing, but we work in how to do constructive comments. It's a bit more relaxed. Uh, we also have uh, the guidelines, which we work a lot, and they have been implemented at the Graduate Institute so far. Um, that talk about like the seminars, how, wh how we can deal in seminars with like this w stereotypical aggressive culture from an economics seminar. We also have some part on mental health, how we can like deal with like all the mental health problems that uh, PhD students have to deal with during like the entire career. Uh, we also have the theater workshop. Uh, which was um, last year we have, and one of the activities that we have, for example, was to practice how to present, but like having the perspective of someone that is not an economic and how we could like get more relaxed while doing, while doing so. And we have a few other activities that are quite interesting, the workshops, and based on like all the research that we're doing, we're trying to just work toward this safer environment where we can like shared ideas and learn from each other. Um, I think that's, that's mostly it. But if you want to know more about the initiative, you can reach out to any of our members. We're like almost 20 now. So please do so. 
Okay, so we're gonna start now with the roundtable discussion. We want to keep it pretty open, so uh, of course we're gonna let our speakers talk first, but then we are gonna engage uh, with you. So uh, you know, don't feel shy, and if you want to intervene, you will have time to do it. Um, so uh, for the first topic of the roundtable, we want to uh, basically understand how the pandemic has affected or, or will affect minority students within uh, uh, academia. And, and so to introduce kind of the, the first question, um, so university and school closures as well as uh, interrupted instruction time uh, already had or will likely have uh, negative consequences on educational achievements of students all around the world, both in the long run and in the short run. And, and uh, at the same time, uh, 2020's graduates, they graduated during a global recession, which we know can lead to uh, so-called scarring effects, such as uh, persistent, persistent earning losses. And while these pieces of news are, 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 of course, bad news in general for students, we also know that the effects of these things, university and school closures, interrupted instruction time, and so on, these things can have very heterogeneous effects in the population. So uh, for our first uh, question, Alejandra, we would like to hear your thoughts on how uh, the pandemic has affected or will affect uh, specifically the outcomes and achievements of, of, of minority students. Thank you, Davide, and thank you, everybody, for being here. So I think because this is a round table, I don't want to take the stage and just dominate the conversation. What I would like to do is perhaps to present an overview of how, what is it that we know so far, to what extent we can extend this to university students, and then maybe share a couple of personal stories on the topic and show you what you answer kindly in the survey about how the pandemic affected us. And maybe we can start the conversation with everybody from them. So what we know from the literature is from previous crises is that crises exacerbate inequality. They have devastating effects on learning. Uh, and these particular effects are concentrated for minority groups, in particular when we think in terms of income inequality. The the COVID pandemic has a specific flavor because it was disproportionately affecting women in perhaps two of many dimensions. One, in their caring roles, both in the labor market and frontline workers, but also in the household. Uh, and also, they were disproportionately representative in the sectors that were most affected, which is the service sector. Now, how we think about these effects in education and schools? Well, in, in terms of primary and secondary schools, so schools were closed, parents were homeschooling, and this is homeschooling happens mainly uh, in the EU, because the rest of the world, they just send the kids home and, well, parents figure out, because parents still need to work in informal markets. But let's try to think about this systematically uh, for university students, and I will think about the situation mainly in, in Western Europe, but there are some similarities that can happen with the developing world. We have a first step that is entering the university, Second, learning. Third, assessment. And then exiting the university. And I think we can think about the three processes. And for the time being, I'm going to abstract of any form of discrimination that could happen outside in the labor market. So what can happen at the beginning at the entry level? So students, as we were seeing today, they present an exam. Or they provide some sort of credentials. What happened with the pandemic when the students that were about to enter the university were not doing classes there were, we could not put the students together in a room to make them have a standardized exams. What did we use? Well, we used this predictable marks, predictable grades. And what we know from previous evidence is that those predictable grades first are noisy signals, uh, but that noise tends to be higher. And the, let's put it this way, affects more the top achievers, but in particular, the top achievers that are coming from minorities, that means women and uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds. But on the other point, so the, the signal that the marks gave the students also became more noisy. So we had the students that perhaps if they would have received an accurate signal of their quality uh, for a specific education path, they would not have chosen to get there. But now we have more noisy signals, so students are making suboptimal investments. And that's a huge problem on entry, 
if especially the, the evidence that we saw today that these suboptimal investments at the entry level also translate in gaps in the labor market earnings. Now, what happens when we have the students in the class? Well, there is learning. And what we all know is that the learning experience was horrendous for most of us, both as lecturers as as students during the pandemic. And interestingly, it's not about what we teach. It's also about how we teach and the technology that we use. So there is evidence now showing that active learning actually helped to minimize the learning um, gaps that the students were having during the pandemics. But what does active learning mean? Active learning means that you have to have a qualified instructor that have previously received training on how to do this or has the time to produce this. Time which, guess who doesn't have because they are homeschooling. Now, assuming that that happens and the students are, are, are effectively receiving the active learning, active learning is more than just sitting in your computer or your phone to receive the lectures. Many students don't have a computer at home. They have to share the computer with their siblings, or maybe the internet connection was not good enough. So the material conditions definitely matter, and we know that the material conditions are, of course, worse for students of a low socioeconomic income on disadvantaged backgrounds. But I want us to think also in the gender dimension, because many of the students that were at home, in particular the female students, also needed to take care of some caring responsibilities at home. Uh, I make this case in particular from my institution in Ireland. Ireland is a country where there's still there are big families, there are traditional gender roles. And this is um, more from anecdotal evidence. What we know from the students, or what they report to students, is that uh, students that self identify as women had to do a disproportionately larger share of the household work at home while combining that with their studies. And this is just in terms of, of achieving that learning, but there is also a very important part of the learning process that we do in universities, and we have our students to communicate with each other, to generate networks, to interact with their peers. So think about students that perhaps come to your university with relatively lower soft skills. And let's just be very broad in terms. Perhaps some of us are a little bit shy or we don't feel as comfortable talking to others, but university gives us five years to, you know, give it a try, start to interact with other people. Maybe today it doesn't go so well, but you know, maybe you don't see them again, so that's also fine. Students completely lost the possibility of developing these social skills, and this was disproportionately affecting with students that come with low soft skills. So we are widening that, that gap as well. Uh, and of course, there is a mental health issue, no? So we have students in isolation with very little access to the resources that universities typically will provide. So most of the universities nowadays will have a student counseling services or a student union or a set of services that were there. But suddenly, the students cannot access physically those services. Uh, and in addition to that, there is a humongous increase in the demand for these services. So we, we have a shortage at the beginning of the pandemic in how to provide the students the care that we would normally provide. And then we go again to assessments. No? So let's assume that the students learn something and we incorporate active learning and you manage to survive the day in Zoom. Well, you have exam. Uh, I think most of you are PhD students, so you probably have to invigilate or some way handle the mess of online examinations. We all absolutely love that. The wide range of examinations that we had, what from take home exams, uh, from live uh, online exams, and then in addition to that, we have to add the beautiful component of different time zones, because guess what we did with most of the students? Send them home. And international students were now required to take exams at 3 a.m. in the morning because that was our way of assessing. What happens with that signal? The signal that we would get from those exams becomes more noisy. And as it happened at the entry level, my sense is that it, it has less information for the students, but it's also going to provide less information for the labor market. Because employers do hire based on GPA, on marks, on uh, medals, or any sort of information they, they could gather from the degrees. And now we have more noisy signals. Now, the question is, how do we think the labor market is going to compensate for that additional variability in the signals that we're having on this informative? 
the traditional channels that we have our networks, the traditional channels that we have our social markers, something that denotes high socioeconomic status, ability to learn, or again, networks. Who has access to the networks? Who had the opportunity to build the network during the university? Well, those who previously know each other from a school. So potentially what we are seeing here is this case in where inequality is going to increase. Now, on the positive side, there is at least one study in the US that has been looking at whether there are differences in learning outcomes for students, and they look at difference among those that are native speakers and non-native speakers, and there is not such a difference. But that doesn't mean that the journey was the same for everybody. And I, I think with that, I, I can, I want to show you the results that you have, but let me tell you two quick stories before we jump there. Let me tell you the case of Trinity College Dublin, uh, which we are one of the biggest university in a city with housing problems. And we depend a lot of our international students. I guess everybody here knows that non-EUS students pay substantially higher fees, and that's understandable given that EU taxpayers' money is funding the universities. However, in my institution, it happened that we told the students that they couldn't leave home at the beginning of the pandemic because they needed to sit the exams. But then, when we realized how bad things were, we closed campus and we closed accommodation. But there were no longer flights to go back home. And those students who managed to get flights back home had to spend five days at least, some spend two weeks in quarantine in their home countries. Well, at the same time, we were asking them to log online to follow lectures at 3 a.m. in the morning, and some of them even had to do exams. And then we asked them to please keep paying the 18K that it cost a year for our education. And that's a very, very, very hard case to make. That doesn't mean that we did all things wrong. I think in the big picture, the reflection that we will have, we have been having at my institution is that we had a sort of a staggered optimization, a staggered constraint optimization in where we started by the first order problems and then keep going down to the least. Uh, unfortunately, the constraints faced by minority students was never, never make it to the optimization problem. Uh, and we make the explicit recognition that we fail to provide equality, diversity, and inclusion in the measures that were implemented during the pandemic. But that also leaves us in a better situation. We were able to create some additional support services um, for, for the students that perhaps we talk about that later. Uh, because I want to show you first what you, what you answer in the survey, because I think it makes it makes us all feel that, oh, we were all in this boat together. So if I may. Sure. Um, and also, um, just to initiate a little bit the conversation, I know it's very hard to, to open and tell your horror stories during the pandemic. So I'll tell you quickly mine. That always helps. Um, I was, I found out that I was pregnant on, let's say, March not January, something like that, and I went to my OB appointment on the 12th of March of 2019? 2020. 2020. 2020, thank you. I don't even remember <laughs> the years. I leave my OB appointment, and we have the Taoiseach, which is our equivalent of Prime Minister in the TV, saying that we're closing everything. So I look in desperation to my OB, and I said, what am I supposed to do? I said, well, you are having a long-distance relationship. My advice as your healthcare provider is to go to your partner because we have very little certainty about how this is going to go and you don't want to be alone. So I took a suitcase, I went to my office, I packed everything I could and I asked my boss to sign a letter that I could work remotely because I am not EU. And I am only allowed to stay in Europe for 90 days without a visa. So I called my partner, I asked, can you please buy tickets and lots of suitcases. I landed on, like in Belgium on the 16th of March and on the 17th, the borders were closed. Uh, I was not able to come back to Ireland until September 2021, because by the time flights resume, um, I was heavily pregnant, so they wouldn't let me in. In the meantime, all of the offices closed, so I could not, not regularize my situation in Belgium. So technically, I was sort of begging every couple of weeks for an extension of my visa with the fear of being illegal in the country. Uh, it took us 
quite a couple of months at the time we finally managed to like, okay, we are advancing. We went to register my daughter because technically she's not Belgium. She was not born yet. So she doesn't have access to healthcare. Uh, my, the authorities told my partner that because we have not regularized our situation, he could not register there. And to, in the eyes of the Belgium government, she was not his daughter yet. We have to first regularize the situation with the beautiful implication that she wouldn't receive healthcare. Um, and in all of that, I was teaching. In all of that, I was connecting with my students. And for me, the, just the mere possibility to connect with them, asking them how you are, and, and reaching out make a huge difference. My PhD students went through a similar horror story, but I think what made the most the difference for us is being there for everybody. So let me tell you how you responded to this survey. Uh, we asked everybody to tell us how the pandemic affected the different aspects of the scholarly work. And we ask you to give us a number between minus five and five, where minus five is, listen, this was a mystery. And five is, well, actually, I did quite well. Uh, and we asked you different items. So we started looking by access to resources for scholarly work. So understandably, that reduced. Time for scholarly work increased, which, of course, we are all at home doing nothing, and we couldn't leave the house. Research productivity decreased. Physical health, surprisingly, was not as severely affected, but I would like to show you something interesting of your responses. But look at mental health. How did we perform? We all report having difficulties in mental health. And life and work balance for this specific demographic is negative, but doesn't seem to be an alarming issue. So we also took advantage of the fact that we ask you uh, the gender identity that you have. So I'm just classifying as female and male. I don't want to give any statistics on other minorities just because we are not a large enough sample. Uh, but what we have in here is that those of you who identify as females declare having a way larger uh, negative impact on your access to resources for scholarly work. Um, but that being said, Physical health did not perform so bad. Mm, mental health, it is there, but I want this, and, and work and life balance, I wouldn't make much comments. But let's ask what happened to our male colleagues in here. And I think it's also important to recognize the, the issues and difficulties that uh, our male allies face. Uh, even though access to resources for our scholarly work was not perhaps one of the main dimensions with that affected us, uh, the effect on physical health felt higher for them, uh, but also in mental health. We can ask the same thing by non-white and white, um, and we can also ask the same thing by EU and non-EU. But what we want you to take from this one, and we'll be more than happy to share these slides with everybody, is that these issues affected everybody in the profession. This is not something that only happened to you and therefore our ability to, to tell the stories of what went wrong, but also what worked well, are very important for us to hear, so that we can keep building on the systems uh, that, that help us, support you, or were beneficial, and get rid of those who are absolutely uh, diminishing and were not contributing to, to the situation. So perhaps this is the point where I think it's, it's important to hear also from you, how did the comic COVID pandemic affected you as, as in your role as students, as researchers, also as supervisors, because uh, this is all what the round table is about. That means that you can ask <laughs> questions or also if you want to provide your experience, you know, you're, you're super happy to hear about it. So, And please, if you're going to ask a question, raise your hand and Victoria will go to you because we have a microphone, so it's recording this. Uh, first, thank you a lot for all your input. Um, it was really interesting. Um, uh, I would like to know, do you think that the pandemic changed student network in terms of homophily? And do you think that students tend to interact more um, with students from a similar uh, background to them um, after the interruption in uh, instruction time? 
Um, I would like to be able to answer that question for the PhD students, uh, but as I mentioned, these are my first conferences in where are in person. From our program, I think the networks became, like they become more like cliques. So those students uh, who, who could easily link or had a group, that group became stronger, but those students who were isolated uh, had more difficulties in staying in touch with the group. Very simple things as um, the time zone difference. So non-EU students were back to their homes, they are from different nationalities, so they struggle to be present in the working series and in the different programs that we make. And upon returning, they also felt a little bit behind in their research and in their skills to communicate. Uh, but this, this is anecdotal. What I think we, we are trying to do at the moment is to overcome that and making sure that we are homogenizing all of the spaces of interaction uh, so that all of the students have equal access to faculty and networks and all of the support so that we don't increase inequalities. So you said that it, you are still recovering it, so it means the effect is still there? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to offer a little perspective from our university. I think for the both undergraduate and PhD in different ways, we saw a big split between US students and international students. Uh, for the undergraduates, all the international students went home and they, had, they were doing literally classes at 2 a.m. and stuff like that, and it was just so much harder uh, for them. For the PhD students, actually, most of our PhD students did not leave uh, at that time, but because half of them, they could not, right? Because places like India and China canceled all the flights, so. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so they also, and all the US students were actually able to go to their homes. So it was a different kind of split, but I think partly because of that, the mental health burden on international students was uh, extremely heavy, because they could not meet their families. They were very worried. Uh, about their families, uh, you know, sometimes they were receiving bad news from home, like so-and-so is sick, which was happening to some other students as well, but they could not be with them uh, in any meaningful way. They could not meet their advisors uh, in person because nobody was around. So I think there was a, so some things are common to all PhD students, but I think in general the burden was higher on international students. Um. There is anyone else that wants to talk? Ellie. Hi. Um, so I guess uh, my what I'm interested uh, in hearing also your opinion about is that my understanding of what has happened right now is that it's very hard to recreate a remote versus in-person work balances right now because there has been kind of a polarization like people who really like to work from home are doing that while people who really like to work in person are really really pushing to go back to the office and I think in academia this is very important because the social norms about how we work together and so on are different and I feel that it has been just difficult everywhere to find a balance again in this sense I, I don't know if you have a feeling about it, about how we should think about going back to work in person or not, and yeah. And if I, if I can follow up on that, um, so your department, did, were there any discussion on how to actually do that, you know, like between professors, like to kind of coordinate and see whether people could move in one direction or the other, like going back to the office or not? Yeah, in my university it was very interesting because obviously in March of 2020 everybody was online and then there was lots of discussions. So we finished the semester, right? And then in May and June there were lots of discussions. The university had, I don't know, an umpteen number of committees to decide what to do next. And I was not on those committees so I don't know what was discussed. But it was very interesting that the president of our university in June of 2020 literally went on national TV and said, we are reopening the university. And a lot of faculty members were very upset. I remember saying, feeling A, that they were not consulted uh, on this decision, and actually they were not, like we, faculty was not really asked to weigh in. You could, of course, if you wanted, go and contact that committee. But you know, how many people go and contact a committee? 
Um, and they felt that uh, the president was downplaying uh, the health risks by saying, you know, making this announcement, we are opening the university uh, no matter what. So in some sense, I think he played the coordinating role. <laughs> but no, I'm not sure it was the best decision, but it was a clear decision. So the one thing I will say, it was very clear what the decision was. There was no, so in that sense, you had to uh, request an exception if you wanted to teach online. And exceptions were allowed, especially if, you know, many faculty members have health concerns and so on, and so exceptions were allowed fairly generously, but it was a very clear signal. Now, the backstory, I don't know how far this is true, but I heard that it was due to market pressure. And because we are a private university, and a number of other universities were facing similar pressure of many students basically thinking whether to come back uh, to the university. So I don't know about your, our university, from a different university I heard a number, something like 20 to 25% of students were planning not to come back if it was all going to be online. So clearly they hated the online. And I think from their parents' point of view, why are we paying these many thousands of dollars if my son or daughter is going to sit on home on Zoom? Right? <laughs> like there was no, they couldn't see the value proposition of that. So that's one theory, that it was this kind of, uh, market pressure, which drove the university to say, no, we are opening it. Uh, that said, it was not fully open. It was half the classes were still online, uh, but at least half the classes were in person with masks since very spread out classrooms. I was teaching in a music room and my uh, colleague was teaching in a hotel ballroom because we wanted to spread out everyone. We had to wear a microphone, nobody could hear us. It, not the best teaching experience. But it might be useful to hear from other uh, perspective. But I think, so I'm, I'm still on mixed feelings when I think back. Was that a good decision or not? Uh, on the one hand, as you say, it saved a lot of discussion and dithering time. Okay. It was clear where the university is going to go. Uh, on the other hand, did we put people at risk? Perhaps, despite taking many precautions, right? We had lots of testing. Everybody had to go every week and get tested uh, and so on. Did we perhaps put people in harm's way? I don't know. Um, I guess my institution has in common that all of the decisions were decided within a small group, which is understandably the way they, they managed to run the things during the pandemic. When decisions need to be taken on the spot, uh, it's very hard to, to bring everybody on board and, and have a discussion. So some of the decisions were taken that way. Perhaps they were not communicate, like we tend to find out some of the things in the news. Uh, but yeah, it, it's part of the constrained problems that we have. We decided to go in person mainly because of the strong pressures of the student union. So we have a very, very organized and strong student body and they were understandably highlighting the mental health issues that they were experiencing and the decrease in the quality of instruction that they were receiving. Uh, also, these were one of the moments in, in where the work ethic came into life because we start seeing recordings of the previous years. Because um, why not? We already recorded, so let's give the students a lecture of the last year. Uh, but I don't think we managed to incorporate the the needs of minorities. So there were specific groups that were at health risk and we did not incorporate or accommodate. There was no policy from Central College on, on how to accommodate for that. And that was led to us. So the way it worked in my department, we're a small department. It was those of us who were managing the boat and were going to the office regularly. Uh, we, we chat with our PhD students that they wanted to come back and they said, well, where is everybody? We, we want to meet you. We want to talk about research. and. And we don't have that. And sometimes just the ability to meet in the corridors means that there is a certain familiarity that can, can promote conversations or a coffee is where a new idea of a new paper will arise. Uh, so we are currently working and doing lots of, lots of uh, group building exercises, activities, half days out with very little take up. Uh, but I, we understand also that there is a, individual choice component and the constraints that individual face cannot be centralized but a head of department and imposed to everybody. Uh, in young departments, you will see that the pandemic also 
coincided in our case with an increase in the fertility, uh, which meant that previous to the pandemic, we didn't have childcare responsibilities to the extent that we have it now. Um, and th that means that the dynamics have changed a lot. But yeah, I think it's still not clear to me what's the best way to proceed. I do value... So it, it's, from an economics perspective, it's, uh, any central planner cannot have the information that the individual have. I don't know what are the constraints of the agents. I don't know what is the best choice set. So we need to provide guidelines, but allow also for flexibility. Now, the problem, of course, what we know as economists is that when we offer those flexible choices, then they are going to affect disproportionately some groups. So if we offer people to cop, come back to work and some others not, uh, well, Guess who are the ones picking the kids out from a school and who would prefer to work from home? And then who are coming to the office and who are going to have the network effect? So it's, it's not a clear uh, solution to me. I want to allow agents to exercise their, their preference and, to, exper and to, to take their choice. On the other hand, we need to be mindful in what are the inequalities that this can generate in the long term. Um, kind of following up on this, uh, just to be like, do you think there are specific solutions for certain like circumstances? So, for example, some of the suggestions from universities for like labor market entrance was that they should receive public support to avoid like large unemployment. So, what do you think it could be like universities could be doing or government even to just kind of reduce that the effect of the university closures, especially on like labor like going to the labor market during a turn down? for minorities? So that's, that's a tricky one. I think even before the labor market, I think one of the things that should, I'm a big advocate of that, I don't think all of the faculty in my department agree, but we should keep hybrid learning open for those students who are unwell or whose health risk are higher and, and coming to a theater with 300 students uh, imposes them uh, a significant mental health risk. Um, so I would say one thing that I do and I invite everybody to do, keep your lectures a live stream. Uh, of course, don't give access to everybody because you want to bring the incentive to come to the university, uh, learn the skills, but there are individuals who who face other constraints, and by introducing a little bit of red tape, it's relatively easy to sort which are the students that really face a constraint and which are the ones that not. In terms of the labor market, uh, we kind of need to understand, first of all, the, the extent of the learning gaps, and we, we need to close that gap, because no money, uh, if that doesn't translate into learning, we might save it, like we might solve the issue one day, but in three years, once the money goes away, well, it's still there. They, they, they learn less than their, their other cohorts. Um, but I think the other component is also the signals that we have. So we could be doing something to make our grades more informative. So internally, what we have is that the variance <laughs> decrease and everybody's getting up around the same range of marks, because also from a pure risk averse response. You don't want to give a very bad grade because there are 150 reasons why the student can say, well, I was unwell, I was having mental health issues, or and many of those are valid. So the incentives are not there for us to give accurate signals and to improve the accuracy of our assessments. And I think that could be done by governments, either by providing a standardized testing, uh, for graduates, uh, but also making sure that we provide additional programs so that everybody, regardless of their exposure to the pandemic, achieve the learning outcomes that would that should have been achieved before. Great. So, I think we. I mean, of course, we touched upon uh, this topic, but I want to specifically move a little bit the attention of the, uh, of the discussion on uh, university employees and you know, specifically faculty members, because these um, you know, school and university closures, interrupting instruction time, they affected students, but of course they also affected you know, university employees and faculty members. And as you said, in uh, 2020, we witnessed a global increase in uh, uh, homeschooling, for example, just to, uh, to think about one thing, and 
this homeschooling place um, gave, gave a new and extremely important role to parents and, and many times to specifically mothers on providing educational uh, services uh, to their children. And, 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 and also like moving all the uh, research and, and teaching activities from an online platform to a, um, to a uh, sorry, from, from a physical platform to an online platform uh, required a lot of uh, experimentation uh, and efforts with trying out different platforms, you know, conducting online uh, student assessments uh, and, and, and research activities such as seminar activities uh, and, and, and visiting activities that have to be done online. So, uh, Lakshmi, I would like to, to hear your thoughts on how these developments particularly affected minority uh, faculty members um, in, your, in your view. So I will sort of structure my remarks uh, yeah, sort of around short term, medium term, and some speculations about the long term because we are not in the long term yet. And I think the common thread about all of these things, I think the biggest change the pandemic has made is in time availability and time use. So if you look at the short term, as you said, we had very big disruptions. All of us as researchers or faculty members had to move the teaching online. Uh, some of us had to uh, stall or even cancel uh, research projects, especially things like data collection, uh, in the primary data collection was stalled. Secondary data collection has been delayed. So for instance, India has not yet conducted the 2021 census. Right? Very basic, but what, you know, cannot blame the government either because uh, everybody's under so many constraints. So, so all of those, you know, so research activities were suddenly and dramatically halted. Teaching time increased for moving to online, actually having to provide more support to students. So many students could not, say, connect to the online thing. And so you make sure that you have the recording available. You give, I, like, I give a lot of extra time on all the assignments. and you know, trying to be accommodative, um, have extra office hours so that they can come and uh, make, try to make up their learning losses. Um, interestingly, my department chair told me that, at least in our department, the teaching, student teaching evaluations uh, during that semester when we moved online was the highest ever. So <laughs> clearly, whatever we did worked in maintaining those evaluations and students were, or maybe they were just appreciative that, you know, it was such a big shock that anything we were doing was very appreciated, but evaluations were very good, it seems. Uh, even though the university has decided not to allow those in any promotion reviews uh, because they felt it might be skewed, but we are now removing the best ones. <laughs> Whole other story. Um, so I think that was one dimension of time, which, was, um, which I would characterize more as a one-time big shift, especially on the teaching dimension, learning this new technology. Many of us had never used Zoom before, and, uh, so getting used to that. I think the second dimension of the time use comes because of the other side, the non-work side, um, which is the school closures uh, and other uh, things like that, or lockdowns and so on. And I think there you have a big divide. You have a big divide between uh, men and women in terms of housework. Um, you have a big divide between people who have children and especially young children, school age children, and those who do not have uh, school age children. And you can see that in a nationwide survey, so there is a very nice paper by um, Deryogina, Shurchkov, and Stearns, and they sent, uh, they did a big survey of about 28,000 uh, academics. So they specifically sent, uh, so that's the number of respondents they got, and they asked about time use. And they find that you know, some of these gaps were there before. So before COVID, women researchers spent 30 minutes less time every day on research and 40 minutes more time uh, on childcare and 10 minutes more on household activities. So there was a gender gap before COVID. And after COVID, it was, uh, I think it became not a gap, it became like a, I don't know what word to call it, an abyss or something like that, right? So the time spent by women on childcare increased by one hour per day. The time spent on housework went up by 45 minutes uh, per day, and the time spent on research went down by one hour per day. Okay, so if you now add up 
one hour less of research time per day, add it over weeks and months, it translates to several papers that are unwritten, right? Um, this, is, uh, this is completely separate of the other disruptions to data and other research activities. This is just time. For the men, it was not that there was no effect, but there was a stark difference. Um, in general, the men's research time went down by only 40 minutes compared to one hour, so they still had a, so they already had an advantage of um, 30 minutes before pandemic, and it reduced by less, so the gap is now 50 minutes per day between men and women. There was a big difference between those who had kids and those who didn't have kids, and because the survey is so large, they can really track this nicely. For both men and women who had no kids, actually there was no diminishment. Uh, of research time. I think even for the women with no kids, it was like 10 minutes or 20 minutes, not, um, 10 minutes, I think. So it was not much. Uh, for the men uh, and women, you can see a lot more for, uh, so the women who had children, their research time goes down by more than one hour per day. For the men with kids, it goes down by 30 minutes per day. So there is a dis, dis um, what do you call it, inequality within the household. So uh, it was very well documented that this, is, this has happened. So there is a huge change in the time use. This was obviously a short run right after the pandemic. And when you're thinking about the medium term, so this is the initial production of uh, research, and that's a problem there. In the medium term, I think the, there are these extra constraints. So these time constraints didn't go away very fast, right? These lockdowns and school closures persisted for months and in some countries for more than a year. Uh, but on top of that, then you started having all these research activities disrupted. Uh, I don't know whether there is a particular gender gap uh, in that uh, because it was sort of more place specific, right? So disruption of field research, disruption of data collection, dis uh, delays in getting uh, administrative data, difficulties in actually some data sources you have to travel to particular sites to get those data. You cannot get them online and those, all those access stopped. I am not aware of any good study which has been done on whether who was disproportionately uh, affected by this in terms of the identity of the researcher. You can definitely say certain fields uh, were more affected by this than others. Obviously, fields which rely much more on primary data collection, uh, survey-based research, or experimental uh, studies, those uh, are going to be much more affected than uh, people who are researching on using earlier uh, administrative data sets. But it's, I'm not sure that there is any gender or national, international, or other types of uh, differentials on that. Um, the second thing I think which has um, really affected a lot is the dissemination part of the research. So a whole bunch of conferences, for instance, were canceled. Then people started restarting and moving conferences online. Um, and I think that's a partial substitute. I'm sure every one of us has done some online conference by now. There have been so many. It has been a mixed bag, I would say. Uh, so I, along the way, I don't want to be only pessimistic. I want to point out a couple of silver linings here. Obviously, an online conference is not the same as an in-person conference, as many of us can see by being here. <laughs> there is a huge difference. Uh, the quality of interaction in many ways is better when you are face-to-face. -face, uh, and you have the out-of-the-conference room interactions, right? During the coffee breaks, just walking together. You meet uh, many more people in a real-life conference than an online. Because in the online, you have to kind of say, oh, you and I are both going to be there and let us just hang on on the Zoom after, or some such. You have to make some weird arrangements like that. Some conferences I know started doing these uh, breakout rooms. Um, they had to have a session of breakout rooms, but then you would kind of go to one breakout room and. It was not quite the same. It was an attempt and a good, you know, worthwhile uh, attempt. But it's, so I think the degree, the number of interactions is lower. Uh, quality of interactions may also be lower. Uh, but, but in one sense, I found it actually refreshing. I don't know. Again, it would be nice to have your inputs on how people, other people have seen this. I have felt that online seminars have been more respectful and much less uh, combative and hostile uh, in economics. Uh, I don't know whether that's other people's observation, but my observation has been people have been more uh, polite and more patient and not interrupting as frequently. That could be because they have just turned on the Zoom and they're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it has been a better atmosphere in, in that sense. People have been a little more respectful of other people's time. And I think the other good 
part of these online seminars is uh, a greater degree of inclusivity for researchers from the global south. They are the ones who earlier were not as well connected and unable to attend as many in-person seminars and conferences. And during the pandemic, of course, they were also the worst, most excluded from the in-person, whatever limited in-person thing was happening. But the online allows them a way to get uh, connected, or at least uh, also because many of the online seminars have been posting recordings later, or the, for instance, the NBER Summer Institute, which is you know very cliquey and very exclusive, they were doing YouTube live stream. I think that is a great thing uh, for, for making things available. So even, at least as a consumer of research, I think is the first step. So I think there, was, there has been a little bit of uh, silver lining there, but I think the loss of the informal interaction is, is bad, was both for disseminating your research and for building the relationships. And this was brought home to me because I was in an online, <laughs> online mentoring session which have also started, again, that's a new thing and that's a good thing, I think, that earlier you had to go to a specific conference to get the, uh, into a mentoring session there, but now it was much more widespread and we had people who were not just in academia but in more research-based organizations who were attending and so on. Uh, and one of them asked me, so how do you find co-authors? And it was made me think about how did I find my co-authors? And for most of them, the answer was I met them in a conference and we were talking and we said, oh, how about we do things together? So for a number of uh, my co-authorships, that's how they have developed. And that's the part which is very hard to do online. So I worry that this is going to affect the longer term trends. So it's, some of the things are short term, we can make up for it in some way, like the presentation and feedback opportunities. But this, the starting of new ideas, the opportunity to meet a wider set of people, and a wider set of collaborations, I worry about this for the long-term uh, future. And this obviously has a disproportionate effect on younger, uh, younger faculty members, PhD students, postdocs. Uh, once you're a little more senior, you already have a network of co-authors, so it's, it's a little easier but than when you have very few, uh, where it's a small network. Which brings me to the more speculative long-term things. So I think that's one thing I worry about is uh, the volume and the diversity of co-author networks. Uh, I, I worry that it's going to become much more in-house. You're going to be collaborating a lot more with people in your own institution, which is not a bad thing, but <laughs> I think there are benefits to having a wider set of co-authors. Uh, the second thing I worry about is um, the topics uh, of research. How will this change in the interaction structure, change the, the topics we focus on uh, and the methodologies we use. So there is a, uh, at least among some people I have talked to, there is a greater readiness to doing field research, uh, especially in far off locations because I'm worried about, okay, what about the COPE? Suppose something else happens like this. Do I want to invest in a multi-year uh, project, right, in a, in a different country? Uh, I think there's a little, become a little more reluctance to do that because the risk of something big like this happening uh, is uh, worrisome. Not we hope nothing like this will happen again, but it kind of you know you get scarred once and you don't want to invest. So I had a project, for instance, of mine in Myanmar, which has just died now. So you know, I'm sure other people can tell uh, different stories. Uh, the th in the middle, I was worried during the initial months of the pandemic, and I was looking at working paper series, and every alternate paper, like one in two papers about COVID. I was not sure whether that's a good thing or not. I felt it was skewing our research agenda a, a bit too much. I think that trend has become a less uh, pronounced. Uh, but I worry also about our lack of ability to study certain things because um, everything got swamped by COVID. So think about a particular, say, studying a particular program in a country and you're saying, okay, you know, there was this particular subsidy program and it started in 2018 and we want to know the five-year effects of it. Well, in between COVID came, so it's like unanswerable because, you know, uh, that program was canceled or it just got swamped by the effects of COVID. I think there's going to be a range of things we are unable to examine now, a range of interesting and possibly very important questions which have become sort of shut down to us. And those are speculative thoughts on long-term 
uh, effects on research. But I'm happy to hear yeah. other people's views. Yeah. Um, before we open, I wanted to ask you something really quick. Just going back to the time use constraints, because I think that that's quite important. We don't know in the long term what are, like we, we know that there is a gap in terms of time constraints and we don't know other outcomes, but this goes really in line with all the research that Claudia Golding has been doing for years, right? Like the motherhood penalty, what happens in other sectors, like in, with low firms, what the biggest gap is not whether women are working or not, it comes from time constraints because you end up not going I don't know, to the happy hour if you have kids, and that's where you make connections. With these, what happens is like they end up publishing, I mean, we talk about that later, mm -hmm. less, but that also affects tenure, that also affects, and what happened is that some universities, maybe they took extended clock tenure, or they moved the appointments one year, but this is still creating a gap, right? A, it just women are gonna end up getting a salary that is lowered in for one year more, and that's where like the gap increases. So I don't know if you have any idea of what universities could do just to kind of support, or like. Yeah, a lot of universities, as you said, provided these policies, like stopping the tenure clock, giving one year extension uh, on the tenure clock. And I think most universities did it as a blanket um, policy for all junior faculty. And I think this actually has created unequal effects. So I can see that in my department itself for people uh, whose research did not have the other constraints like access to data or field work, this was actually great. So the econometricians, the theorists, the uh, people who are doing more uh, secondary data work, it was actually a great thing, I mean, if you could get the time. But it was nice to have that extra time to bring the papers to fruition. For people, I know my, some of my colleagues in development economics are like, what's the point of giving me one additional year? My project is gone, right? Mm -hmm. Or I cannot restart my project. I don't know when it will happen or, you know, by which time sometimes if you're doing panel surveys, you cannot find the people and all kinds of uh, disruptions happen. So I think this is going to increase, what do you call it, disparities across fields. Um, there is a previous paper, a very depressing paper, uh, by, I'm telling you the authors in a minute. I wrote down the authors and I have lost it already. Sorry about that. Okay, I am forgetting the name of the authors and I apologize for that and I can put it there somewhere. All right, it's ah, Anticol, Bedard, and Stearns. They looked at this before the pandemic. They looked at gender neutral tenure clock policies, and some of you may have read this paper, they looked at the top 50 economics departments in the United States, and over a long period, 1980 to 2005, during which time many universities put in place this uh, gender neutral tenure clock stopping policies, which is if you had a child, you could extend your tenure clock uh, by a year. And that was for both men and women. And they found that as a result of this, the men's probability of getting tenure went up by 17.6%. The women faculty's probability of getting tenure went down by 19%. So this was um, a gender neutral policy which had very gender unequal effects. Uh, and I could see that when I read this paper, it took me back unfortunately to times in my life where I really felt this personally. So as an example, uh, my university, I was at the Harvard Business School, we had a gender neutral tenure clock uh, stopping policies. You could get an extension and I remember one of my colleagues a male colleague also got that extension. And I'm like, your wife and child is actually in a different city, okay? <laughs> so it was great for him, right? He got extra time, which he didn't have to spend in, in actual childcare, mm. right? So uh, then there was the other colleague who talked very wonderfully and happily about how he was, uh, keeping his wife company while she breastfed the baby in the middle of the night, but every time she was breastfeeding, he was able to get half a page written. I'm like, thank you. Doesn't <laughs> apply to me because I have to feed the child. All right, so I, I, when I saw this paper, I'm like, okay, I see exactly why that happened. Uh, but I worry that this COVID extension will unfortunately, because we have also have the studies on the documented differentials in time use, uh, may also follow this pattern of benefiting certain people, particularly 
those without children or without childcare responsibilities. It doesn't have to be by gender. This just happens to be by gender in the, in the world. But it's essentially those who have children and who have to take care of the children. I think it's going to not affect them in the sense, I don't, I don't think it's going to benefit them particularly, but it might benefit uh, the ones who, in a sense, didn't need it. Now, the question is, what could you have done instead? Uh, instead of providing a blanket extension, the only other way is to do target, right? Well, that is difficult to do, in especially in a large university, when you have to see everybody's home circumstances. It's just hard to make a policy like that. It's, it's, so that's the one I struggle with. Like, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know the right answer, but I do worry that this policy, while well-intentioned, may help some people, but may not help many others. Okay. Um, do you want to, anyone has questions or what? Following on your suggestion on the silver lining during the cloud of COVID, that the COVID opened conferences like NBRBD, we conference for the entire world. So from my personal experiences, some of my friends doing PhD in India, they were really happy when they were allowed to participate summer schools or conferences online. So I personally believe that the, the COVID actually helped some of the minorities in very resource constrained countries to actually participate in conferences and summer schools. So as an academic for both of you and in your, as a part of your faculties, what would your opinion or how would you like to pursue to keep most of the conferences and summer schools, at least hybrid, to allow the students and PhDs from developing world, which will actually have a positive effect on the minorities in the long run? Um, so let me put it this way. I'm 200% for a hybrid mode. Uh, but we need to be careful in assuming that that's the overall solution because it does provide access to individuals in the academic profession that before had no access, but the quality of the interactions that they're having is by no means comparable to the quality of the interactions that people who are in person could have it. So I, I want to keep it open, I just don't want organizers and staff or other institutions to think, we have it solved it. We no longer need to provide a scholarships for people to come in person. No, it's like this increased inclusion, but this is not uh, the, the overall solution. But I think it's also a very nice one thing that you're doing, and it's like when we have all of this crisis, there are good things that arise. Uh, and I think, at, at least institutionally, we always receive a nod to technology, VPN, and so on. And now it's like, well, no, every single room is equipped with hybrid mode learning. and and that broaden the choices that we have. Um, so I think I, yeah, I think the pandemic leave a good thing in terms of technology and, and capacity increase. Um, yeah, but I don't think we, we, we need to be careful in when acknowledging that improvements, making it seem that they are the solution for all of our problems, because they are not. They are just a band-aid for keep improving. Yeah, no, I think I would agree with you. These are second best, you know, because what's the counterfactual? Counterfactual is zero access. This is much better than that. It's not the first best, because it's still not bringing the developing country researchers on par with the other types of resources which are available uh, to more developed country researchers. But yes, overall, I would recommend that I think universities, conference organizers should continue uh, to keep things hybrid or you know, uh, accessible to more people. I would point to other thing like in the AEA meetings now, the first round job market interviews are all online. I think it's unmitigatedly a great thing um, because it saves a lot of travel costs for everybody. I think we should be mindful of the planet. I think it's great for the planet. Uh, but also, I think for women and other uh, minority groups, it I think has made the interview process much more comfortable. Um, otherwise, it was always weird, honestly, as a woman, student especially, to walk into a hotel room <laughs> with three other men there, and there's not really place to sit, and some people are sitting on the bed, and some people are, it was a very uncomfortable uh, dynamic, uh, honestly. And this way, like when, when our department did interviews last year, online, they basically said, look, every time we have a female candidate, we want at least one female faculty member to be present. And that was so much easier to do because it was on Zoom, right? 
I didn't have to travel all the way to you know, some city and spend three days or whatever. Uh, so it, those kind of things were much easier to organize and it's so, I think that has been a great, uh, one of the good things to come out. Yeah, a comment to follow on the, the hybrid format. I mean, I think we should be very careful of what we do hybrid for. Uh, so I think um, now we have all the rooms that are well equipped, and it's you know, new toys to teach, which uh, which, uh, which I found great. Um, I think there's some format that can be uh, to support the in, uh, the in presence teaching. For instance, I mean, taking my own personal case, I know systematically rec record and put on, Mood on the Moodle page simply because it allows the students when they take in presence, and there's always over two hours a moment where you lose track, so that you can watch it. But that's very different from having someone follow at a distance. Uh, and if we decide, say, oh, we can now include broader group, I think we should have classes that are purely at distance because it's a different pedagogy. It's not just doing your two hours weekly, and you have to also build a asynchronous interaction, etc. So I would be very uh, leery of saying, oh, now we're here, we have a camera, great, and we can reach out. It's, these are two very different formats of teaching, I think. I'd be curious to hear your thought about that. Uh, no, like I absolutely agree with it. Like the teaching pedagogy when you have an in-person class and when you have a remote class is completely different. I guess hybrid will solve short-term things that we have identified that are individuals who are unwell or that who could potentially get everybody else sick uh, or temporarily are facing uh, the higher risk by coming to the university. But uh, there are different modes of learning. What I like about it is that once we made that explicit recognition, our like educational supply can reach other places of the world that before were not there. Uh, so as an example, we have the Trinity Impact Evaluation Unit and we run a summer school on impact evaluation. In our previous years, most of our students have to come in person, uh, take this course, uh, they receive, some of the students from the developing countries, they receive a scholarship from Irish Aid, but they have to apply for the visa, so sometimes they never manage to make it on time for the course because of the visa. Uh, now we realize that we can actually teach the course online, that we can pull together some of the resources and we record part of the lectures, and then we have a complete different uh, learning and teaching methodology in where we combine recorded lectures with live sessions, but everybody is remotely. Uh, but there are two different products, or say in a way, two different educational products. And uh, we could not have done it before the pandemic because we would have thought that first there is no demand and then there is no capacity. So this is one of the things that I had liked. But for, I would say, instruction at the undergraduate level, I think hybrid should be thought only as a temporary solutions for particular cases uh, that face higher risk at the moment. At the graduate level, I don't think, especially master level, I don't think institutions are going to go for fully online, basically because by going fully online, we make the master's market incredibly competitive. Uh, so a small institutions do not have the incentive to do that because what they offer is interactions and market and labor opportunities. Uh, and that is the main attractor for international students, which are the ones that contributing a large part in the, in the finances of the, of the master's for PhD programs, I think we can make big improvements by making our lectures more accessible. So for instance, uh, there is an initiative that for the courses of development allows the students from the developed world to join the classes remotely. Uh, so we are teaching them hybrid, knowing that there is a group of students that they can join. We interact a little bit different with them and follow up with them. They pay no fee whatsoever for accessing those lectures. And that is something that uh, we, we see as positive and want to keep. So I think there are different uh, strategies at different levels of instruction. And of course. Let, let me give an example of a macro development class, which um, there's a structural transformation and economic growth initiative, STEG, which is housed in CEPR in London. And they did a macro development PhD class last spring. It was fully online because nobody was teaching in person anyway, and it was all through guest lectures. And I said, okay, you know, all this literature didn't exist when I was a PhD student, so I wanted to just attend the classes. 
Uh, it turned out that 10 of PhD students at Notre Dame also wanted to attend the classes, so we were all there. <laughs> uh, but I think what was interesting was two things. One is, as you say, it really opened up opportunities. They said, Let's, we'll just see if, who, who wants to sign up. They were not sure of the demand. 500 people signed up, which was astounding to even the organizers. They could not believe it. Um, and earlier, they had, they had thought, for instance, that they would have everybody online and able to interact. They said, no, we cannot do it now at this uh, scale. So they had to change the mode of delivery. Um, many people dropped off after the first lectures when they realized it's mathematically intensive as a PhD class, but there were at least 150 people still attending regularly, including from places all over the world. There were people from Africa and from Asia and from Central Asia and, you know, um, and so that was, that was the great part, the inclusivity of it. They had world-class professors doing the lectures, but you have to worry about the delivery mechanism. So obviously you want people to be able to ask questions, but you cannot have these many massive people yeah. interrupting. So they basically had two professors for each lecture. One would be doing the guest lecture, and uh, another one would be monitoring the chat. Because there was no time for the main lecturer to even address the chat. So there was, it used to be like the second professor is typing long answers. So you needed actually two equally qualified people uh, like, you know, they would be asking in the chat, the professor would be doing a model and that in the chat, but what if you make a risk aversion part of the model? Uh, and then the second professor who also knows the literature will type, well, this, then you should read this other paper and who shows it doesn't make such and such a difference or whatever. But you, I've realized that you needed, in a sense, two professors uh, to make it work. So I think this is one example of how the delivery mechanism has to be changed, but it was actually very effective. Uh, I learned a lot attending it, but I think you could, you could not, you just take an, a regular class and throw the lectures online, as you say, is not the same as online education. Uh, yeah, a quick uh, thought about uh, this uh, discussion about online versus in-person teaching. And I wanted to share an idea about uh, improving my teaching that I'm going to, I have no idea whether this will work. I'm going to implement it uh, starting next week. <clears throat> so what I uh, noticed when teaching online, and I don't know if this is a shared experience, was that I was getting more questions via the chat than I used to have in class. And I also had the feeling, all by thinking about this, but also sort of looking at the names of the students that were asking questions on the chat, that this was slightly more inclusive, meaning that I believe the students that were asking questions on the chat, although they were, you know, they could unmute and ask a question during the online uh, uh, lecture, uh, where students were not particularly comfortable asking questions in class or uh, during the Zoom uh, lecture by simply unmuting themselves. And I presume this correlates with belonging to some minority or disadvantaged uh, group. So I, I thought this would be something that I wanted to keep uh, even you know, once, as it would be the case uh, uh, for, for this coming term, uh, when teaching resumes to be in person. So what I've planned to do is to have a, a platform, Moodle has this forum uh, that uh, you know, uh, people can use at any time, open during the in-person lecture, and students can ask questions either in the usual way by raising their hand and interrupting my uh, you know, lecture and asking the questions the usual way, or by writing, things, writing the question in the forum, and then every 20 minutes or so, I'll stop, and, uh, and answer the questions that are in the chat. Uh, and I have the feeling, I don't know whether this will happen in the end, that this might actually encourage uh, students who would uh, otherwise uh, shy away from asking questions in class to, uh, to do so. And uh, again, I presume this type of behavior correlates with uh, being part of, of some kind of disadvantaged group, uh, minority or, or disadvantaged background uh, and so on. So I wanted to, you know, share the idea, see whether you've had the same experience, and, you know, perhaps if you think it's a very bad idea that I should not do it, or well, please uh, say it. Yeah, so it's both good and bad. I agree with you, it brings new voices into the classroom. Um, it's people who are very shy, uh, people who are otherwise underconfident, and also uh, non-native speakers of English, or whatever language you're instructing in. So 
I remember one of my f um, international students was very happy with the dual mode because he was attending the class online um, in person, but I was recording everything and making it available, right? He's like, I often go back home and listen to the recording again because my English is not good enough. So I don't understand everything the first time, but I understand half, and then I listen, and then I understand it better. So I agree with you that this is a good thing and it's a worthwhile thing. What I found hard to do was doing this monitoring the chat in the middle of a classroom session. It is, uh, I found it clunky to do, like stop every two, 20 minutes and read the chat. Then you have these people sitting in front of you who are just staring at you reading the chat. Um, not every question in the chat deserves the online, um, the immediate answer at that moment. So I think this works well if you have this dual instructor thing. You have a very good TA uh, or somebody else who's, you see what I mean, who's monitoring and say there is this interesting question in the chat beyond, because many of the questions in the chapter are, chat are what, um, clarificatory, right? What was uh, A subscript T again? And you, that's not, and that answer, if you start answering 20 minutes later, people have forgotten. You see what I mean? That's not working very well. And if you are trying to moderate in the middle of the chat, it's harder uh, because you are reading all the non-essential comments and then trying to pick the really essential ones which you should address in the class. So I don't know how to do it exactly. Um, in general, they told us when switching to Zoom that plan to teach only 80% of what you would cover in a normal session, which I found to be absolutely true, uh, even without the chat, but because by the time the interaction happens, it's so slow. So I would suggest either have somebody monitor the live thing or have them contribute the questions to the Moodle after class, and then you spend a, a few minutes in the beginning of the next class saying, here are three questions which came up in the chat which I want to address, uh, rather than addressing it in the middle of the class. I just feel, I didn't, for me it was disrupting the flow a lot. So can I add quickly perhaps in my experience of teaching this, um, as usual, mode of delivery changes by course. So I happen to teach first year statistics for 400 students in the same room, uh, hybrid mode. Uh, there we have the chat and we keep it open because we have this hybrid lecture. Most of the students just come, but some of those who are sick, they just stay at home. Uh, with this specific group, it works quite well to have the chat because even the students who are in the lecture room that do not feel comfortable participating, they interact. And this is something that has come in a couple of focus groups that we have been running with women in economics, trying to identify how we can increase their participation in the lectures. Uh, one of the things that have helped me to, to make it work is one of the TAs is remotely connected and then whenever someone, can, like half of the time the students address, answer the question within their own and sometimes they even write to their colleague who is in the class and said, can you ask this for me because she is not reading and then they ask and they say, uh, Juanita online wants to know blah and I said, yes, of course uh, and that that has worked quite well um, in, in big classes, but normally a TA that can remotely uh, check the chat will do the trick. Anytime I have opened something for them to complete later on, yeah. that's it, they don't do anything. Like it's Whatever happens in the lecture room happens in the lecture room. Um, then for higher years of instruction, I still keep the hybrid one, but those are smaller lectures. And the game changer for me was, I'm not making advertisement for them, is the Bose uh, earbuds that they have the aware mode. Because I wear one of those and I keep it in aware mode so the students who are not physically there can ask their questions live, but I can still hear everybody else uh, and I'm not going crazy. So that works quite well, uh, that technology. And I, I'm wearing the microphone so I can still run around the room uh, and write things, but the students who are joining remotely have uh, live questions and that works quite well for third and four year students, so we have a longer undergrad. Uh, and in general, with them, I do not encourage uh, anonymous questions because part of the skills that they need to learn is how to communicate. So yes, I understand you're shy. Yes, I understand that it's challenging, but I prefer to invest in making the classroom a safe environment uh, and, and making that the working culture from day one 
so that they learn that skill, because otherwise I'm not making them a favor. If they go to the job market without being able to express their concerns, their views, what is going to happen is that someone else is going to appropriate their ideas. Uh, and I tell that at the beginning, I said, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to call you on the spot and, at the, and you're free to say, I don't want to participate, that's absolutely fine. But that gives the idea of the same environment. And the other thing is the students know what's the best. So just run a survey feedback uh, at the middle of the term. Usually there is a break or something like that. So what I do whenever I implement a new technology in the classroom is I go, I make a survey at the middle of the class, I ask what worked, what not, and the students are very quick in telling you it's, yeah. this is not working, and that's it. Thanks. Uh, so I guess we can use like the last seven minutes to discuss a little bit about um, scientific production in general. Um, so we knew that even before the pandemic, minorities were underrepresented in academia. Uh, just to give you an example, women, we know they are publishing less, uh, they have less citations, they are less likely to obtain uh, tenure. And there is some evidence showing uh, that during the pandemic, these gaps have widened. Um, so for the last question, we would like to hear your thoughts on how uh, the pandemic particularly affected the research activities of, of uh, minority researchers. And you know, especially we have, we were thinking of, you know, paper submissions, publications, and possibly tenure decisions. Yeah, so, and we have Michele too. Michele uh, is editing uh, labor economics, so uh, we, we can have a first-hand experience of what happened during the pandemic. Uh, he was editing during the pandemic, so. Um, thank you, so, um, so labor economics is, a, is the journal of the, the official journal of the European Association of Labor Economists. I would say it's a good uh, second tier field journal. Uh, we receive a lot of submissions. Uh, submissions went up uh, during COVID, especially 2021, uh, by a good uh, 15, 20%. Uh, not so much in 2020. Uh, I guess most of it was due to papers uh, about COVID, <laughs> uh, which uh, we were not able to produce in 2020, but started to, to appear in 2021. Uh, a lot of them were not very good quality, uh, to be honest. Uh, mostly because of the data issues, not super good quality of the data. And uh, um, other than that, uh, the most uh, important effect that I have noticed as an editor of, uh, of COVID <coughs> is the uh, longer referring times. Mm. Uh, so the most evident effect that I could uh, notice is referees often uh, justifying or requesting uh, longer uh, deadlines uh, to submit their reports due to you know, very reasonable uh, justifications. Of course, uh, I've got COVID. Uh, my partner got COVID, the kids are at home, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't, so, so there, there are papers that have looked at uh, submissions by gender, uh, and uh, uh, there seems to have been, uh, uh, so the increase in submissions that we've experienced, uh, in fact, much larger in uh, health-related uh, uh, journals, as you can imagine. Uh, though that increase has uh, been disproportionately uh, uh, stronger for men than women, so the gap seems to have uh, uh, widened. I don't have a feeling of what happened at uh, our journal and uh, for the submissions that I've handled. One, because gender is not uh, regularly uh, recorded in the submission. You I, I don't know of any journal where you have to tick a box, uh, and certainly not at labor economics, where you have to tick a box uh, about your, your gender identity. And two, I honestly hardly notice the, uh, I try to not to pay attention to the names of the authors to the point, anecdotically, that I Dexter rejected the, you know, a couple of years ago, the submission of a colleague, of, of a co-editor colleague. Uh, who was not super happy about it, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
so so I, I, I don't have a clear feeling of what happened in terms of submissions and uh, success rates also of the submissions, uh, revise and resubmit uh, decisions and publication decisions by gender or other dimensions of... Uh, uh, we do have the indicator of the region of origin of the paper. Uh, but again, I don't think my experience would be very telling about uh, uh, more general trends because we are the journal of the European Association of Labor Economists. Right. So anyone can submit, but we typically you know, receive most of our submissions from, from Europe. Um, I guess to, to speculate a bit further, and when I was uh, sort of talking to David about this, when David asked me to uh, sort of think about this, I guess even if there was no particular uh, difference by gender in the effect of COVID on uh, the, uh, this increase in uh, decision times that the uh, delays of referees that I've noticed has presumably generated, uh, yet I think longer publication times are disproportionately worse for young women than young men on tenure track because tenure track is typically the time of uh, uh, you know, fertility decisions. So there's, there's, it's more likely for women to experience interruptions in, uh, in uh, productive time uh, during tenure track. So longer decision times are presumably, I believe, uh, worse for uh, uh, young uh, female uh, faculty than men if I have to speculate about uh, sort of longer term implications. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to add to this? Well, I think there, there are perhaps two things. One is that overall uh, the process of submitting the paper is a final process of a very long production function that already incorporates all of this uh, gender inequalities. So as usual, if we try to tackle like when we look at the differences in submission rates and acceptance rates and so on, it matters, of course. But uh, I think most of the problems are going to come in the pipeline and most of the policies I would advocate should be going uh, to that pipeline. Um, also in terms of promotion, one of the things that it has been implemented in my institution is that the metrics for promotion have been slightly adapted. Uh, so now a data set is also a potential research outcome. So for those of us who, whose field work was a stop and we could not conduct the end line until, or now we're chasing students all over the world, um, that's one of the things that it has been uh, implemented. And then probably another aspect that I want to, I, I think it's very, it's very reassuring to hear that there is this blind way of assessing the paper um, and, and the decisions are not taking on the dimension of gender or ordering just on, on quality and this is what we expect and we, what we aim to have in the profession. Uh, but as a young female faculty uh, with, with this new role of, of motherhood, I, I am very grateful for one email of an editor in where she requests me to referee a paper and she's a top researcher in my field, and I can I want to do everything I can to, to please her and work with her in the future. Uh, and I said, well, yes, but I'm still on maternity leave, so I can can I have a little bit longer, please? But I will have the paper for you ready within. And she kindly wrote to me and said, thanks so much, Alejandra. Uh, you're still on maternity leave. If you have any time, just make sure you invest it in your papers, sending your papers before investing your time in refereeing this paper. And it was incredibly helpful to me to have that reassurance from a senior person helping me to make the choice that, of course, is the optimal one, but in my minority or vulnerable position, I was not able to make. So I really, that, that was a fantastic one-off experience but I really value her feedback, and, and I think it would be great to have that incorporated more often in the profession. Yeah, I would second that in, in universities when doing administrative work. So hiring committees, committees on all kinds of things, student outcomes, committees on diversity, committees on whatever. Um, 
So this came up recently because we have a newly established policy school and so we don't have that many faculty yet and so the junior faculty were actually on many committees. And we were reviewing a junior faculty's record for the third year renewal, uh, contract renewal and we said this person has actually been in less than three years, they have already been on four committees. And I said, this is too much. This, is, this person should be focusing on getting their research out. Why are we putting them on four different committees? And honestly, hiring committees are a lot of work because you have to read the papers and decide whom to shortlist and so on. Um, and one of the senior researchers, one of the senior people I remember said, well, they could always say no. I said, no, they cannot say no because like you, they are in a sense, not minority, but they're the less powerful people in an institution. If a senior colleague asks them, can you be on this committee with me? And of course, it is in their field. It's not like we're asking them to review something different, but it is work. And a junior person cannot say no very easily, uh, whether it's, you know, regardless of other characteristics. And so I was trying to push very hard to say, no, we as seniors should not ask them in the first place. Don't say, oh, they can always say no. They don't feel uh, many times capable of saying no. <laughs> So it's, uh, I think it is, it is uh, there is an onus on more senior people to protect the junior people's time and say no, you should say no for this. Mm. So in fact, I remember one of my mentees, I told him, I said, next time somebody asks you to be on a committee, you tell them that Lakshmi said I should say no. <laughs> and they can come and argue with me about it if you want, but you know, if you feel uh, you know, scared to say no, just say, <laughs> tell them I told you. I was about to. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I was about to sort of add a comment precisely about this because uh, we are under well under pressure. We do receive. We are encouraged both by the association and the edit and the publisher to uh, balance more than in the past the cho across genders the choice of referees. So ideally, they would like to have a female and a male referee for every paper. And of course, the, po the, 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 the population of potential referees is not 50-50. Yeah. So if we try to impose that, we increase the burden, the number of requests on female colleagues to referee papers by you know, an, an, an enormously more than for men. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, so, so what, what that also means that, uh, is that uh, any increase in the uh, number of submissions that we have to handle increases disproportionately the number of requests for referees for female colleagues than for male colleagues. And if I pair this with uh, what I perceive uh, being, uh, uh, you know, th there's this congestion of uh, uh, activities that restart now that uh, the pandemic has uh, sort of faded out, uh, you know, hiring commissions that were not done in the past, uh, conferences that were uh, cancelled and that are now and, and then the, that are organized now. Uh, I, I, I don't know, it's your experience more than mine, I believe, but I, I fear that uh, precisely now that the pandemic sort of fades out a little bit, uh, there is uh, the, 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 the restart of uh, uh, the p picking up speed of economic activity, of academic activity will result in uh, uh, you know, disproportionately high requests of uh, participation in commissions or refereeing, et cetera, for, for female colleagues. So thank you. Uh, we are a little bit over time, so I would like to thank you all for uh, being here and participating. Uh, thank you, Alejandro and Lakshmi, for giving your very insightful uh, views on this topic. And so I think we can conclude uh, this uh, round table. Uh, again, thanks, everybody. <laughs> and the day is over. Uh, we have the dinner. <laughs> we do have a dinner, so those of you and who And the picture. Are, <laughs> ah, yeah, so we have to take a picture. But I don't, I don't want to take the picture. No, uh, no, no. Yeah, well, probably. anyone that wants to be in the picture, we're going to meet in front of the park in five minutes. You should be there. You're Plus La Vida, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and then so for those invited to the dinner, it's a 15, 20 minutes walk. Or you can also take the tram uh, if you prefer. It starts at 6.30, the aperitivo, and the dinner at 7.30. Um, 
Oh, yes, the conference resumes tomorrow at 9. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again.